Prime Minister, I suppose you're quite glad about what's happened in, in Afghanistan. I mean, it suits Pakistan very nicely, doesn't it? John, I'm glad because um, we were anticipating the sort of bloodbath that took place after the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan in 1989. Almost 200,000 Afghans died in that uh, five, six year period. So we were petrified here that um, when, when the US left, there would be a bloodbath, a similar bloodbath. And from, for Pakistan, there were consequences. Most of all, refugees. We already have three million refugees and we have no capacity to take any more. And secondly, if there, there was a protracted civil war in Afghanistan, which is also what we feared, because we never thought the Taliban would just take over Afghanistan. We thought they would immediately take over the Pashtun areas, but, the, but there would be, we thought, a civil war. So that too would have had implications for Pakistan. So from that point of view, no bloodshed, relatively, it, it has been a peaceful takeover. Uh, so up till now, yes. But what happens from now onwards is a, is a lot of concern to us. But the Taliban are really a, a Pakistani creation, aren't they? Absolutely not. Taliban were creation of the environment after the Soviets left. The warlords started fighting each other. And uh, in that chaos emerged Taliban. And why did Taliban emerge? Because they gave people a semblance of rule of law, which did not exi exist before. Previously, when uh, this is before Taliban took over, every 50 mile there was a checkpoint. There was a warlord who would then take money. And so it, it was a fractured Afghanistan uh, after the Soviets left. So Taliban gave people a semblance of rule of law. And that's why they, 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 they prevailed in Afghanistan. And so... Sorry, excuse me, though. You were saying there wasn't the rule of law in, in Afghanistan for the last 20 years when people's lives were lifted up beyond anything they'd ever experienced. Uh, uh, no, John, I, I'm talking about when Taliban took over in 96. I'm talking about that period, when from 96 to 2001, when, so they were not a creation of Pakistan. Pakistan actually was backing Gulbuddin Hikmatyar. He was the, uh, the, the, the faction Pakistan was backing against Ahmad Shah Massoud. Another, another extremist, another Islamic extremist. Uh, extreme, well, all the Mujahideen were, were, were religious, uh, fighting in the name of religion. They were doing jihad, so they were all Mujahideen. Uh, they weren't quite, they weren't secular people who were sort of fighting the Soviets. But all I'm saying is that when we backed one faction, in my opinion, we made a huge mistake because we should not have interfered. We should have just, whatever government the Afghans wanted, we should have backed them. So when you back one faction, the other turns against you. So uh, in my opinion, it was a mistake. Pakistan made a mistake. Uh, but. Taliban came out of nowhere at that time. I'm talking about 96. But now they also came out, mm -hmm. of, out of nowhere. And the, most of the educated, many of the educated people, the more uh, kind of advanced people of, of Afghanistan are, are leaving in their thousands because they're terrified of the organization which you actually seem to approve of. John, this is just not true. First of all, you must understand that Afghanistan has a history. Afghanistan has resisted invaders throughout their history. I mean, you, know, you would know the British in 1842 when they invaded Afghanistan. Initially, it's a country which is easily invaded, but then starts the resistance and it slowly it grows. It happened against the British. It exactly the same thing happened against the Soviets. Initially, there was hardly any fighting, but then gradually, even when almost a million Afghans died, the fighting was more intense at the end. So similarly, when the, uh, w when the Taliban were dislodged in 2001, initially there was nothing. But gradually the resistance grew. 
And um, from people like us from 2008 onwards, I went specifically to America to tell the think tanks. I met Senator Joe Biden. I, I met John Kerry, a senator at the time. And I explained to them there was not going to be a military solution. And at that time, they could have had some a political solution. In other words, sort of an inclusive government. But the US kept going for a military solution, which there wasn't one. So Pakistan was not responsible for what this current situation. It was actually the coalition trying to find a military solution, which didn't exist. And secondly, I and John, we never knew what the US, what their idea of victory was in Afghanistan. I mean, if it was Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda was decimated in the first two years. It was finished. So what, what did US hope to achieve? Nation building, democracy, liberating their women. Whatever these aims were, these were not going to be attained through military, military action. When the Taliban took over, you were quoted as saying that uh, Afghanistan had thrown off the shackles of slavery. You must be really embarrassed by that I, quote now, aren't you? I know. Look, first of all, it was a, I was making a speech in Urdu. The speech was about we were inaugurating for the first time in Pakistan's history one curriculum for the whole country. Until Pakistan inherited the sort of colonial system, which was for a tiny elite, it was the English medium, our education system. For the rest, it was Urdu medium. So we had this two-tier system in Pakistan, one for the elite, one for the masses. So after 70 years, my government finally, we had a unified curriculum up to class five, and we, I was inaugurating them. And my exact words were that mental slavery is far more difficult to shed off than physical slavery, and I mentioned Afghanistan. So it was in that context. Uh, it was just translated into English and sort of, uh, it came out not as I intended to. No, I understand that. Um, but this is a really good opportunity for you now to say you condemn the excesses of the Taliban and that you feel that by, for instance, preventing women from, from getting a decent education, once again, um, they're taking the wrong direction. Would you like to say that to us now? John, absolutely. Our religion, if anyone has, um, you know, uh, any idea of what our religion was, it was a liberation of women 1,500 years ago when it came. Our prophet, peace be upon him, we regard him as someone who gave rights to women, who freed slaves, who gave uh, equal rights to minorities. Everyone was an equal citizen. Uh, he ended racism. So we look upon him at age of uh, advent of Islam as enlightenment. And so whenever uh, the idea that women should not get educated is just not Islamic. It might have been some rural culture uh, in Afghanistan, but it is, it is nothing to do with religion. And, and can I say what the Taliban, the statements they have made since they've assumed power, I mean, it's very encouraging. They have said they will have an inclusive government. They, they have said they'll get, uh, women can, uh, have, can work, can have education. They will give amnesty to everyone. The soil won't be used for terrorism by anyone. Uh, you know, these are encouraging statements. So you're approving the, the way the Taliban are operating? No, I'm, I'm approving of what they have said. What happens now, I'm afraid, John, I can't say what happens now. In fact, no one can tell where, this, where Afghan, Afghanistan goes from here. But what we hope and pray that finally after 40 years, the people of Afghanistan will have peace and stability. And you'll give the Taliban time, will you, to show whether they're the kind of government that you can approve of? Or will you say to them, 
they've really got to shape up and, uh, and behave properly. You know, John, I think uh, this is a great opportunity for the international community to actually incentivize Taliban uh, to, to, to walk the talk, what they've said, to make sure that they go in that direction. Because as compared to last time, I find that the Taliban are seeking international acceptability. I think they, are, they recognize that the situation in Afghanistan, uh, unless the international community helps them, this could really spiral out of control and, uh, and um, it could really, uh, ha uh, there could be a huge humanitarian crisis. So I think that they are reaching out to the international community and that gives leverage to the international community to make sure the statements they've made, they actually implement them. I must say from my own experience in Afghanistan, what tends to happen is that the, the, the Taliban leaders say one thing, but real day-to-day, moment-by-moment power exists in the hands of uh, the people, the, the vigilantes that go around the streets. They're the ones that decide what the state of of, uh, of, forgive me, of, of Afghan kind of society is. And it doesn't really matter what the top Taliban leaders say, uh, it, life is still going to be pretty terrible for ordinary Afghans. John, again, you know, I cannot say which way Afghanistan will go from here. And as I said, we are quite tense that uh, uh, if this, I mean, my biggest worry right now is the looming humanitarian crisis. Because remember, 75% of Afghanistan's budget was foreign aid. So once you take away the foreign aid, they, I mean, they are facing a huge uh, uh, crisis ahead. So where Afghanistan goes from here, I don't know. But all I can say is that uh, um, they clearly, from, from watching from outside, there are factions within the Taliban. They're, they're clearly the Taliban who are, who are at the moment at the helm are trying to get international acceptability. But then there are those who have, uh, uh, who have been in the field for 20 years, uh, uh, you know, uh, who would claim that they'd given a lot of sacrifices. I would imagine there would be a lot of problems within the, uh, within, within the Taliban. So where this goes, as I said, I, I'm afraid, I'm not in a position to say what will happen, but I know what we want to happen is that if they can stick to uh, the statements they've made, uh, it could be a new beginning. Is that what your, um, the head of your intelligence organization, the ISI, told the Taliban leadership when he went there the other day? Uh, the, the, the head of uh, uh, ISI, uh, General Fares, when he went there, his main concern is, that there were three different terrorist groups that have been attacking Pakistan using the Afghan soil. One is ISIS. ISIS has conducted various at attacks, especially in Balochistan against the Shia minority, the Hazara community in Balochistan. Then there are the Tariqe Taliban Pakistan, the Pakistani Taliban who were pushed out from here and, and who were in Afghanistan, who conducted attacks into Pakistan. Recently, they conducted an attack and, uh, uh, and targeted the Chinese workers in Pakistan. So, and that was a serious, uh, 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 it, was a, it was a serious terrorist attack. Uh, and then thirdly, there are the Baloch terrorists, the separatists who use Afghan soil uh, to conduct attacks in Balochistan. So um, our main concern is that Afghan soil should not be used for terrorism in Pakistan. I see that. I, I just find it hard to understand how the uh, Pakistan Taliban can be terrorists in, 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 in Pakistan's view, but not the Taliban that they support, have close links with in Afghanistan. Surely they're terrorists too in those terms. Yeah, but, but, but John, look, Pakistan sided with the uh, international coalition, with the United States after 9-11. Pakistan is the country that suffered more than any other coalition partner. In fact, 
all the coalition partners of U.S. put together, they did not even suffer a fraction of the casualties what this country went through. 80,000 Pakistanis died because we joined this war uh, against the Taliban. Remember, we were the coalition. All the logistical support to fight the Taliban or to dislodge them went through Pakistan. Pakistan was an ally. And the only ally that almost, there was a point we thought we were going down because there were 50 different militant groups attacking the state of Pakistan and, uh, and there were different types of Pakistani Taliban. There were no militant Taliban in Pakistan before we joined this coalition. So we were considered collaborators. We, we were, we, we, the old Mujahideen groups who we had trained, financed by the United States, who were fighting the Soviets, they called Pakistan collaborators and targeted us. So this country took the greatest amount of suffering by being part of the coalition. So the reason why the Taliban are back in power is not because of Pakistan. If you want to know the real reason why they're back in power, all you have to do is do an analysis. Why did 300,000 well-equipped of Afghan army uh, give up without a fight to 65, 70,000 lightly armed militia? If you go into the details, which we have, that is the reason why the Taliban are back in power. It's not because of Pakistan. And yet, there is this constant link. I mean, they started off in Pakistan. Uh, they had uh, all the, the support of the ISI, of Pakistan intelligence at the time. I mean, I saw this uh, for myself. And they're now back. And there is a definite sense here that Pakistan has gained because the, in India, your big opponent is, has been thrown out of Afghanistan completely, and you're the ones that are benefiting. Uh, but John, look, you must know the situation, and, and, and you do know, because you know this part of the world I, better than others. Pakistan, after the US, uh, uh, Soviets left of, uh, Afghanistan in 89, and so did the US. Pakistan at the time was left with five million refugees. Five million refugees stayed in Pakistan. Uh, after 9-11, there were still three million refugees in Pakistan, Afghan refugees, and all of them were Pashtuns. So what happened after uh, the Taliban were dislodged? You must understand what happened. Firstly, all the border along the Pakistan, the Pakistan side, the, what was called Fatah, the tribal areas, there were Pashtun tribes which were split by the Duran line where there was no border. It, there was a free flow of people right from the time, you know, since we existed. When the Russians, when the Soviets were in Afghanistan, this is from where the whole jihad was launched because there's no border there. And it's 2,600 kilometers of border between two countries. This is the first time in, in, since my government we fenced 90% of it. So what happened was the tribes this side all the, it, it wasn't because of Taliban ideology, it was Pashtun ethnicity, the Pashtun nationalism that they sided with the, the, the uh, Afghan Taliban. They ceased to be Taliban, they, they became Pashtun, which always has happened throughout history. The 80 year history of British in the tribal areas of Pakistan, throughout the 80 years, there was some part or the other there was fighting going on. There were more British soldiers that died in the tribal, in Waziristan than in the whole of India. So this part, this turn against Pakistan after the moment we sided with the, with the coalition, they turned against us. And that's how we lost 80,000 people here. So there were 50 different groups operating against us. So what was Pakistan doing? And ISI, number job was to protect our own people. So, uh, like the U.S. in the last three years, they did a deal with the Taliban not to attack the U.S. You know that in Afghanistan they did a deal with them, that they were not supposed to attack the U.S. Similarly, Pakistan was doing deals with the various groups not to attack, uh, not to attack us. 
So amongst them were Pakistani Taliban too. There was a Waziristan Accord in 2006. There was a Shakai uh, Agreement in 2007 with different groups. And since Afghan Taliban were not attacking Pakistan, so they had an agreement that they wouldn't do anything. It's not the same as backing them. It's just that not taking military action against them. When I met President Ghani, I went specially to see him. How we, we, because we did not think the Taliban would be able to take over. We thought there would be a protracted civil war. So we were desperately trying to get some political settlement. And I told, I said, I will do everything except taking military action against them. Tell us what we will do. We will try and convince them. And we did everything. Unfortunately, they would not accept President Ghani. Pakistan's got one really important lever uh, that it can use uh, to get what it wants in Afghanistan, and that is the question of recognizing the, the Taliban as the legitimate government. Are you going to do that? Uh, just one thing, uh, John, I want to make clear. But people don't understand the Afghan character. Afghan is, Afghans are this a country which does not accept outside interference. We were the three countries uh, in 2001 that, rec that recognized the then the Taliban government. When after 9-11, the US asked us to help them uh, flush out Al-Qaeda or ask the Taliban to give up Osama bin Laden, Pakistan tried its best. They flatly refused Pakistan. So, you know, this idea that Afghanistan can be sort of controlled from outside, it's never happened in history. The moment uh, uh, any head of uh, Afghanistan is perceived as a foreign puppet, he loses credibility there. So, what, what you're saying is that uh, Pakistan has this leverage about recognition. We, I have spoken to all, I, I just went to the SEO conference in, in Dushanbe, and I spoke to all the neighbors, Iran, Uzbekistan, Tajik, Tajikistan, which is because there's a big Tajik uh, minority there and uh, they're very upset. So I, I spoke to the president there. And so all of us decided that we will, we, will, we will collectively take a decision to recognize Afghanistan. And that decision would depend upon, will they have an inclusive government? The, their uh, assurance of human rights, and that Afghan soil should not be used for terrorism, and neighbors are the most worried about that. So that's where it lies. So does that mean that you will recognize them if they agree those three points? We, uh, we will collectively take a decision. So Pakistan itself will not decide on its own? No, I exactly. We, we think that uh, uh, all the neighbors will get together and we will see how they progress and then to, whether to recognize them or not will be a collective decision. And the fact is that Taliban aren't really going to have an inclusive government, are they? I mean, they haven't even got the, the non-Taliban um, uh, non people who've helped them into power. They're not, they've been excluded so far. Uh, so far, they haven't. They haven't uh, got an inclusive government as we hoped they would. Uh, but then they, they say that this is just a transition. This is not a, 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 their final government. And, um, you know, we are trying. I, I'm, I'm uh, trying um, uh, that, um, that we should speak to them and ensure that they, they, they do have an inclusive government because there will not be any long-term sustainable peace or stability in Afghanistan unless all the factions, all the ethnic groups are represented. But I mean, there's something more important than anything to the Taliban government, and that's the kind of purity of, of their, um, their ideology, their religious ideology. Uh, I mean, they're never going to allow women to go to schools or anything like that, are they? Because it cuts a, across their whole notion of what a society should be. I think they will allow uh, women to go to schools. Uh, um, they will allow that. Well, they've said they won't. They've, uh, as far as we know, they've assured us. So uh, they're doing it. They say they're doing it in phases. But, but that remains to be seen. Uh, look, John, 
where what they do from now onwards, we can only hope to sort of uh, persuade them and encourage them and incentivize them in that direction. But you know, sitting today, what happens? Where they will go? I'm afraid. I don't know. But you can influence it by helping the other countries round about to decide to recognize them or not recognize them. We have already, I, I told you, John, I've already spoken to all the neighbors. I have, I've spoken to the Iranian president. I've spoken to the Tajikistan president, the Uzbekistan president. They're the most relevant. And we have all decided that unless and until there's an inclusive government and they, as they, 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 they respect for human rights, uh, it would not be possible for us to recognize them. So it really does depend on what they themselves do. Absolutely. Because you see, apart from anything else, John, the, let me tell you from Pakistan, our biggest worry. Our biggest worry is that this will, A, a huge humanitarian crisis, and that would immediately lead to a refugee problem. Uh, secondly, if uh, they do not have an inclusive government, and gradually it descends into a civil war, which, would, which if they do not include all the factions, sooner or later they will, you know, uh, they will have again um, a, a sort of a civil war. That too will impact Pakistan. It, be, it will mean an unstable, a chaotic Afghanistan, ideal place for terrorists, because if there's no control or if there's fighting going on, and that is our worry. So uh, in, uh, terrorism from Afghan soil, and secondly, uh, if there's a humanitarian crisis or a civil war, a refugee uh, uh, issue for us. Can I just ask you, just go back on something you said. The, the, the Taliban leadership has assured you or suggested that it will allow women's education again. How, what, what, how, how strong was the assurance? No, they've given public statements. Their, uh, uh, their spokesman came on television and said the women will, will be allowed to work, they will be allowed to study. He just used the word uh, in the Islamic context. So, uh, uh, and I guess what he means by Islamic context is that, you know, they will uh, uh, have segregation. In other words, uh, uh, they will not have co-education. So I guess that's what it means. But he did say that they will be allowed to study. Before, of course, they would blow up girls' schools and kill anybody in them. I know, I, I mean, um, this, uh, this idea of not allowing girls, girls to study, believe me, has nothing to do with religion. Because, I mean, we, we give special stipends to our girls, uh, uh, the parents of girls, we give them extra money so that they would put their girls in school. So when you see what's happening in Afghanistan, you, you must be pretty disgusted, actually, with the way that the Taliban are behaving. Um, I, think, I think, John, what we should hope for and try for is to make them go into that direction. And I, in the direction, in the, in the statements they've made, and secondly, you know, I, Afghans are very strong people. I mean, they are, they, they're just, uh, as a race, they're very strong. Their women are very strong. I feel give them time and they will assert their rights. Um, how, much, how much time? Years? A year, two years, three years. At the moment. Three years. But at the moment, uh, uh, John, it's just too early to say anything because it's just ba barely been a month after 20 years of uh, civil war, they have come back into power. So a month is no time. Look, my party came into power after 22 years, 22 years. And trust me, for the first six months, it was the most difficult period of my life because, you know, if, you, if you're not in power, you come into power after such a long time. It is so difficult because there are people who have struggled with you, all want a peace, all want to be in government, you know. So there's, it's, it's, a, it's a very diff, 
فار آس اٹ واز دی موسٹ ڈیفیکلٹ پیریڈ آئی تھنک اٹس جسٹ اے منتھ ٹو منتھس ان اے شارٹ پیریڈ آف ٹائم وی ول نو دا ڈائریکشن دے آر گوئنگ آئی ڈونٹ نو آئی ایم این آپٹمسٹ آئی تھنک دیٹ یو نو دیر از اے چانس دیٹ دے ول بی پیس ان افغانستان آفٹر فورٹی ایئرس And once there's peace and stability, the Afghan people are strong enough, they'll assert their rights. Afghan history shows us that actually movements like the Taliban, and, uh, leaders like, like the Taliban leadership, don't really last very long. I mean, they lasted five years last time. This is not a permanent answer to Afghanistan's problems, is it? No, I don't think so. I think this is just a beginning. And um, as I said, Where it goes from here, no one can predict. But what we hope is that they will have peace, the Afghan society will assert itself, they will get their rights. The Afghan women are strong, they will assert their rights. But for, for all that, you need peace and stability. In a civil war situation, everything gets stunted because civil war just distorts everything. So peace is the key and, and, and we hope that Once there's peace, uh, uh, Afghanistan will move in the right direction. Um, can I ask you now uh, the other questions, uh, the, a couple for the Urdu. Okay. Relationship with India, uh, between Pakistan and India, is really, really difficult at the moment, isn't it? Uh, Pakistan says that India must reverse Kashmir's special status. Is that realistic or unrealistic? Look, uh, John, the problem is کہ جب تک ہندوستان پانچ اگست دو ہزار انیس کو جو انہوں نے کشمیر کی اسٹیٹ ہڈ لی تھی غیر قانونی طور پہ یونائٹیڈ نیشنز سیکیورٹی کاؤنسل کی ریزولوشنس کی خلاف ورزی کی تھی کہ جو بڑے واضح طور پہ کہتے ہیں کہ یہ ڈسپیوٹیڈ ٹیریٹری ہے پاکستان اور ہندوستان میں اور صرف ایک پلیبسائٹ کے ذریعے کشمیر کے لوگ فیصلہ کریں گے کہ وہ ہندوستان کے پاس جانا چاہتے ہیں پاکستان کے پاس تو اس کی جب انہوں نے ایک انٹرنیشنل کمیونٹی کی جو 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 وعدہ کیا تھا کشمیر کے لوگوں سے جب اس کی خلاف ورزی کی تو پاکستان کے لیے بہت مشکل ہے ان سے بات چیت پھر سے شروع کرنے کا جب تک اس کے اوپر واپس نہیں آتے ہم ان سے بات چیت نہیں شروع کر سکتے ہاؤ ڈو یو تھنک دیٹ دا سکسیس آف دا طالبان ان افغانستان ول امپیکٹ آن دا سچویشن ان کشمیر جہاں تک مجھے سمجھ ہے اس کا تو کوئی کشمیر کے اوپر فرق نہیں پڑے گا لیکن کسی وجہ سے ہندوستان کی حکومت یہ سمجھتی ہے افغانستان میں طالبان کے آنے کی وجہ سے کشمیر پہ فرق پڑے گا مجھے تو یہ سمجھ نہیں آتی کیونکہ افغانستان کے لوگ تو کشمیر میں نہیں لڑ رہے تھے تو میرے خیال میں یہ سائیکلوجیکل ہے اصل میں تو کوئی فرق نہیں پڑنا چاہیے طالبان کے آنے سے کشمیر کے اوپر The Taliban haven't really responded very enthusiastically to your suggestion that they should set up an inclusive government. How do you, how do you get that? Is it really possible? Look, in my opinion, it's very quickly. Now it's been a week, a government has come back to the Taliban for 20 years. It's been a week. It's been a week. ایک مہینہ بہت جلدی ہے جج کرنے کے لیے ابھی تک جو طالبان نے جتنی اسٹیٹمنٹس دی ہیں انہوں نے کہا کہ ہم ایک انکلوسو گورنمنٹ لے کے آئیں گے جس میں سب کو شامل کریں گے ہر نیشنلٹی کو ایتھنک گروپ کو تو ایک ایک ان کی شرکت کریں گے حکومت کے اندر اور انہوں نے ہیومن رائٹس کی بھی بات کی ہے تو انہوں نے ابھی تک اسٹیٹمنٹس تو سب ٹھیک دی ہیں لیکن ابھی بہت جلدی ہے کہ ساری دنیا ان کو ان کے اوپر نظر رکھ کر یہ رکھی ہوئی ہے کہ وہ کب کریں گے میرے خیال میں بیس سال کے بعد جب کوئی حکومت اقتدار میں آتی ہے اس کو ٹائم لگتا ہے ہم بیس بائیس سال کے بعد جب حکومت میں آئے تو ہمیں شروع میں بڑا مشکل تھا کہ ایک دم حکومت بھی چلاؤ اور پھر کس کو شامل کرو کیونکہ جن لوگوں نے قربانیاں دی ہیں وہ سارا حکومت کا حصہ بننا چاہتے ہیں لیکن میرے خیال میں طالبان بھی یہ جانتے ہیں کہ اگر افغانستان میں امن آنا ہے اگر اسٹیبلٹی آنی ہے 
تو اس کے لیے بہت ضروری ہے کہ سب کو سب کو شامل کیا جائے مثلا تاجک ہیں ازبیک ہیں ہزارہ ہیں ان ساروں کو حکومت میں شامل کیا جائے اور تب ہی ایک اسٹیبل گورنمنٹ بنے گی تھینک یو ویری مچ